want to uh, want to read a testimony to you. Can't remember where I put it on my phone. This is from um, this is from this week. Uh, this is somebody that does not live in our area but joins us by Zoom, and uh, I want you to hear this testimony today. You prayed at the beginning that there would, this was last Sunday service, you prayed at the beginning that there would be something special just for us in the online audience, and was that prayer ever answered? Yesterday morning, I received a word from the Lord that during the evening service at our church, God would place someone in front of me, and I was to command sickness out of them in his name. This was our first official healing service and the worship leader felt that I should switch from playing on the worship team to joining in the prayer ministry. Commanding sickness out of someone in a public setting is not something I've ever done before. I needed confirmation. What you said at the end of the service just blew me away. You said you felt like someone was asked to do something unusual in faith and that we should go for it. I just about fell off my chair. And Adam, I totally did it. It was one of the most exciting things I have ever experienced spiritually to pray for a miracle over someone with 100% faith, knowing it was God's will, was an experience I will never forget. And hopefully one that I will repeat many times over. You haven't heard the miracle yet. The joy in this man's face after being touched by the Lord and the faith when he stood up, you could see him question, do I even need this crutch anymore? He just wept, overcome with the love of God. I will never forget the sheer joy on his face when he passed me on his way out of the service. Thank you for giving me the courage and the faith boost I needed to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, God is so good. He is so good. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your incredible kindness. Thank you for the expressions of goodness through healing and through love, joy, and peace in our lives. Thank you for your rhema word. Thank you for the now word. Thank you for the daily bread that's been prepared for us today uh, by your spirit. Thank you, God, that that word will not return void, but it'll accomplish what you send it to accomplish. And so, Father, we just ask right now just for a weighty presence of God to be present, that this wouldn't just be a lecture or a study or a class, but that this would be a time of impactful ministry. The word of the Lord, the, the voice of the Lord that goes forward and creates things. God, we just pray today for that impact. Your words are spirit and life. We approach them, God, with, um, with humility. We approach them knowing that there is life in what you speak, that one word from the Lord can transform our lives. One word from the Lord can transform situations. One word spoken from your heart through your voice can shake nations. We thank you, Father, for that. We thank you for that today, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to have some tea together today. See if that can bring back some of my voice. Um, so outpour on Friday. Let me just reference that at the beginning. Uh, it's so important to be obedient to the Lord, no matter what he asks you to do. There are moments in the Bible where we see the walls of Jericho came down with, with praise and worship and a shout. They came down with a shout. We look at places like Gideon's army where the victory was won by the army of 300 by shouting. 
They, they broke their jar clays. They exposed the flames of fire, the torches they had in their hands. They raised their voices and they gave a victory shout. Jesus is known as the lion and the lamb. And I want to know God in every capacity. I don't want to be one of those believers that picks and chooses how I want to know the Lord. But I want to open my heart and I want to know him in every way that's described in the word. In every way that he wants me to know him. And he's the lion and the lamb. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. But he's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Something happens when a lion in the wild, when it roars. He's known as the, is it the king of the jungle? He's, he's known as that for a reason. Because when you hear the lion's voice, everything that's within earshot pays attention. It knows that voice, and it knows the power that, that is in the animal that the voice has come from. And when the lion of the tribe of Judah roars, People take notice. We stand at attention. And I felt like Friday night, I, I, in the first song, the first song, you know, I knew that, that something was di different. I knew that something was going to happen on Friday night. By the second song, I had, a, I had more of a clear direction of what I felt God was asking. I've had experience with the roar before. Um, we were praying for my sister over here. Uh, I don't know how long ago it was, year, year and a half ago. And uh, there was a miracle that was needed, and I felt the Lord say, you, you got to release the roar. And I did, and I gave it everything I had. And uh, you were healed. Yeah, absolutely. So I know the power that's in the the voice of the Lord, and all I want to do is line up with what he's doing. And I felt like he needed to give a roar that night. He wanted to give a roar, and so I let out a roar. <laughs> but I, I wasn't alone. Those that were here Friday, I just want to say I honor you for joining in, joining into the roar joining your faith and expressing what God was doing. There's victory shouts. There's roars. It's putting the enemy on notice that we're alive and well. That we're here to fight the good fight of faith. And that we're victorious. And as you can tell by my throat, I'm still enjoying the marks of battle and victory. Here's another testimony. Um, there's a person here on Friday, and the very first outpour that they came to, they came up for prayer to the ministry team, and the ministry team prayed for the baptism of the Spirit. Um, to, be, to be a gift, you know, the, the gift of tongues for this person. And um, they didn't receive it that night. I, do, I don't know, I wasn't able to ask, but I don't know how long ago that was. But on Friday night, as soon as the roar was released, this person testified to instantly began speaking in tongues. Instantly the gift expressed itself. See, the spirit of religion doesn't like it. <laughs> spirit of religion doesn't like it when you start to address it and when you resist it. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we often think of that verse in the sense of, of well, I just got to resist him for sin, this sin or that sin. No, we got to resist him and his cohorts. It's resisting the spirit of Jezebel and not allowing control 
to make you disobedient to what God is saying. It's addressing the spirit of religion and saying, I'm not going to let you crystallize or put into a form the tangible relationship that I have with God. Because that's what religion wants to do. It wants to take the tangible life-to-life relationship and it wants to crystallize it and, and put it into a put it into a shape, into a method. It wants to take the Bible and reduce everything to, to a, a, a method of doing things, a principle, so that there's no longer the heart-to-heart engagement with the Father. There's no longer listening to the rhema voice. We see this in the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's 400 years of silence, silence from the Lord, 400 years of silence, and what happens? Groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees are are born. In those times where the word of the Lord is ignored, in the times where the word of the Lord is disobeyed, in the the times where the word of the Lord, where, where hearts are hard and don't receive his voice, in that time of silence, that 400 years, religion was able to run wild. And by the time Jesus shows up, there's, there's this elaborate religious structure with all its fancy appearances and robes and all these things that have been set up. But Jesus starts to dismantle the religious spirit. And can I say that he wasn't kind about it? I don't think he did it politely. The roar that I let out on Friday was not polite. It wasn't gentle. It was violent. The ground the enemy has taken, he can't have any longer. I use the words, there's a holy irritation and a holy frustration for what the church for what we've allowed the enemy to, the land that we've allowed him to have, the mindsets we've chosen to believe or the, or the lies we've believed, he only has power when we believe what it is that he's saying. He has no other power outside of that. None. So the religious spirit has no place, no place here, no room. Do not give the devil a foothold. We take back those footholds. Whatever the spirit of religion has crystallized, whatever resistance it has attempted to bring to the authentic expression of the Lord and his presence, and the kingdom of heaven on earth, or we take all that back. We take what's rightfully ours, and we will live in the kingdom of heaven in the land of the living. We will live in the kingdom of heaven that is now, uh, that is ours, that is at hand, that is, is within us. That kingdom is our portion, and the full expression of it, the full expression of relationship with God is ours. So the Lord yesterday sent me to this, uh, the verse, you know it, Zechariah 10, 1, where it says, ask for rain in the time of rain. And this is such a good verse. And, you know, you look at ask for rain in the time of rain. You know, in this verse, we see our part and we see God's part. We see, you know, God says, ask for rain in the time and the season of rain. It's not our job and our role to make up the times and the seasons. It's his job to make up the times and the seasons. And it's our job to ask to participate in what he is doing. There's too many places that have asked God to bless what they're doing, their initiatives, instead of blessing what it is that he's doing. There are places and there are people out there that are asking for fire in the season of rain. They're asking for wind in the season of rain. And there's barrenness because we're not in line with what the Spirit of God is doing. 
And so when the Spirit says something, there needs to be a yielded heart and a response that lines up with what it is that He's doing. I want to be somebody that knows the sons of Issachar that understood the times and knew what to do. We need to be a people in this hour, in this season that are like the sons of Issachar, that know what it is he's doing. And it's like, well, why if it's raining, would God ask us to ask for it? It's raining. It's because our asking is the hunger we're showing to participate in what he's doing. He needs a people that will steward what it is that he's doing in this hour. And if it's pouring with rain, your asking is the sign to him that you're ready to steward what it is he's doing in this hour. Heaven needs participants. There's a reason we're on this earth. There's a reason the church is on the earth. It's to be participants with heaven to see heaven come to earth. So many people pray with a doctrine or a theology of just go ahead and do it, Jesus. And he's saying, well, I want to do it in partnership with you. I want to do it in and through you. You're going to be an ambassador of Christ to the world. So shape up. See what it is I'm doing. Give your yes and amen. Ask for it and participate. It's not an asking that's going to say he's not going to give it to you. He's not going to say no. It's an asking that reveals where your heart is. I want it all. I want to be a part of it all. I don't want to miss a moment. I don't want to miss a service. I want to be all in. So last week, we, we talked a little bit about the grave clothes. And uh, I apologize about the, uh, the video. It wasn't recorded. I had the USB stick sitting on my nightstand at home. I'll take that one. But we talked about the grave clothes, and I just want to make a very quick note before I, I break into today. Um, the grave clothes. Look, the enemy wants us to spend all of our time looking at ourselves. The enemy wants us to spend all of our time in self-improvement efforts. He's trying to lie to us that what Jesus accomplished on the cross wasn't enough and that our mission in life is somehow to to enter into a self-improvement regimen so that we can present ourselves to the Lord someday in the future, maybe 75% better than we were. When Jesus said, it is finished, he wasn't lying. He wasn't joking. He meant it. The cross was successful. Salvation was successful. And what he did in us, that we became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, what he did we can never do for ourselves. But again, it's it's the picture of the grave clothes. We look at the grave clothes and we try to use them to dictate our identity instead of the miracle of salvation that's happened in our life and use that to dictate our identity. We see a little grave clothes on people and and behaviors, and all of a sudden we turn into this, oh my goodness, we gotta, you know, we gotta design programs and we gotta fix ourselves and we gotta know you just need to know who you are, and then you'll behave accordingly. You need to know what the fullness of what happened inside, and then you'll behave accordingly. But the enemy wants to get us wrapped up in this self-improvement program. That's just a shadow. It's not reality. And what he's trying to do is distract us from the real mission of the church. Jesus did say, go and make disciples of all nations, not spend your lifetime trying to perfect yourself. It's okay to clap. (laughs) It's okay to say yes and amen. The Bible says they receive the word with gladness. 
it's okay to laugh and smile as well. <laughs> or I could just do it all myself. <laughs> Go and make disciples of all nations, not spend time perfecting yourself. Do we want to improve our behavior? Of course we do. We want to be great representations of Jesus. The world needs to see a clear picture of who he is in all his loving kindness, in all his grace and power, in all the glory that it really is. And he'll see it in you when you know who you are, when you understand what happened at Calvary, the new creation realities, that you were crucified with him, you were buried with him, and you also were raised with him to new life. <laughs> Not old life. You weren't raised again as the same person. You're, you're different. Well, I don't look different. I don't feel different. I still part my hair on the left side. Something, something happened on the inside. You're different. Turn in your Bibles with me to Luke 5. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. This is the catch of, uh, the miraculous catch of fish. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or Gennesaret, if it's a soft or a hard G, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from, from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. There are some people here today and you're not sure about the deep water. You're not sure about stepping out that deep with Jesus. You're not sure about the call. You're asking for more direction. You're asking for more vision, for more insight before you make a decision. But I want to tell you today that he is faithful and true. And whatever he says, it's safe to do. And there's a call that's going out right now, I think, to the church worldwide, to the global church. There's a call going out to go deeper, to come out to the deep water. I'm telling you, if Jesus wants to go there, you want to be there. I'd rather be with Jesus in the deep water than having pseudo safety on the shore. The only place to get the miracle catch is in the deep water. Your resistance to go into the deep will be the difference in the fruitfulness of your life. Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything. That's been a lot of people's responses. The common sense. But I've done this for so long and I haven't seen a breakthrough. But I've done this for so long and I haven't seen anything. You know, it's okay to have your excuses as long as you follow it up with this. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. I 
I know we have excuses. I know that we have, we have history. I know that we have things that we've learned over the years and things that have worked and things that haven't worked. But if Jesus says it, we'd better do it, no matter how many times we've done it before. Verse 6 says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. I've got a vision in my heart to see such a unity in the body of Christ that I could pick up my phone and call another boat and say, we need some help. Let me ask you this question. If they didn't call the other boat over because it said both boats were about to sink, if they didn't call the other boat over, what kind of harvest would they have had? Just one boat full. But because they were willing to call another boat over, they had two boatfuls that were willing to sink. What do you think would have happened if they called a third boat over? The structure that we're building needs to be larger. The wineskin that, that God is building in this season in the church, it needs to be larger. We need to have a bigger vision. It needs to be big enough. It needs to have a lot of boats. We want to see Kingston impacted with the gospel. We want to see salvation pour across this area. It's going to take many boats. We're praying and we're working hard to, to see unity in the church in the area so that this, this verse, so that this story can be fulfilled in our city, so that our nets can be full, all of our nets can be full, all of our boats to the point of sinking. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Something happens when the power of God shows up. It's incredible what happens. That spirit of religion is famous for having a form of godliness but denying its power. And that's, that's the lie in it. It looks like God, but it rejects his presence. It rejects his involvement. It silences his voice. It quenches the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. But when the power of God is allowed to manifest, when you hear testimonies like a couple of that I shared this morning, then things like this happen. There's a realization in Peter's life of who he is when the power of God manifests. It says, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners, the sons of thunder. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, <laughs> left everything, and followed him. I was listening to a, a message by Pastor Bill the other day. And he took this passage, and there's one thing I want to reference that he referenced that was just so good. And it's this idea that we look at this miracle, which is astonishing. It's incredible how you can fish all night and not catch a single thing. And then at the word of the Lord, go out and catch so much fish that your equipment begins to break. That you could bring in such a harvest. The story on its own is so incredible. And, and what it looks like at the onset is it looks like a story of provision. It, it looks like on the onset, it looks like that it's a story about Jehovah Jireh. And it is, but it's much more. And what you need to know about Jehovah Jireh is that if, 
if you can handle it, if your nets can handle it, he'll pour out so much, he'll pour it to the, the breaking point so that your boat's going to sink. He's the kind of God that feeds 5,000, which was probably about 15,000, and has all these basketfuls left over. He's not wasteful, but he's lavish. There's no limit to the resources that he has and that he will give us. And he will give you what you're able to steward, but he won't give you any more. He won't give you something you'll make an idol out of. He won't give you something that you'll mishandle or missteward. He won't give you something that will steal your heart away from him. But he'll, he'll meet your needs, and if your heart allows, even more so that you can start to meet other people's needs. So it, it looks like that this is a story of Jehovah Jireh and a testimony to, to that aspect of God. It's what it looks like initially, but all of a sudden it transitions when Jesus says, you will be fishers of men. And what Pastor Bill alluded to was all of a sudden this has become the initial or the primary picture of the church's evangelism efforts. All of a sudden, Jesus paints this picture of, hey, you know, you're earning a living doing this, but there's something more important that I'm about to call you to. You'll be a fisher of men. And the picture he gives of, of evangelism for the church are nets so full that they're about to break. He doesn't give this picture of a fisherman on the shore with one rod. Hopefully I'll catch a fish today. The evangelistic picture that Jesus gives is that the nets are about to break and the boats are about to sink. There is a move of God and a revival that the earth is wakening up to in which this church isn't large enough, in which the other churches in the city, they're not large enough. The church and the earth, the buildings, they're not big enough. They're not ready to contain the harvest that God wants to bring in. We need, we need to align our teeny-weeny vision. Our teeny-weeny vision. <laughs> we need to get on board with what Jesus says and the picture that he gives. We need to be the people that are willing to move out into the deep to respond to his voice. You, you know what happens out in the deep? And, um, you know, this is just an observation from my heart, is that for boats that were built in this era, Boats that were built in this age, my assumption is that for them to go out into the deep would expose that tiny sailing vessel to possible storms. It would expose them to the elements. It would put them out in maybe a little bit more danger. And that's what happens to churches that are willing to go into the deep, is that you feel the opposition. But there's too many churches and there's too many leaders that shrink back in fear. And the church suffers for it. They get the fruit of what, of what their response to the Lord has been. We need to be a people that are willing to be where He is, to be where Jesus is out in the deep. Because there's no power in hell there is no power of the devil. There will be opposition. In this life, you will have trouble, but don't lose heart. I have overcome the world. To bring a clear representation of who Jesus is today, we need to be out in the deep. We need to respond to the call. Will there be opposition? Absolutely. I'm willing to take it. I've walked through opposition for a long time. Opposition of the enemy, opposition from the religious spirit and the spirit of Jezebel, and opposition from 
people who have allowed that spirit to operate in their life. But I'll tell you one thing, the reward is worth it. To be able to stand here and recite even just those two testimonies from last week is incredible. It's worth it all to see the power of God transform lives and do what the power of God does. So he says, you'll be fishers of men, and he gives them this picture of a harvest of a catch so large that their structures, their current structures can't contain it. So was this prophetic picture fulfilled? Was it fulfilled within their lifetime? It absolutely was. It was fulfilled in the book of Acts when Peter stood up, the same Peter. He stood up and he preached at the revival and he said, this is what the prophet Joel said. The Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men would see visions and dreams. This is it. And they saw 3,000 added to their number that day. That, that's a catch. That's not an altar call of one or two people. 3,000 people in one day, 5,000 a couple days later, and so on and so on. The multiplication. God is looking at a revival and a harvest so large that our churches will be bursting at the seams. We've got to be a people in this day that can say, ask of me, that will respond to the Lord from Psalm 2 when he says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. We've asked for family members. We had prayer on Friday for family members. We've asked for family members. Let's ask for neighbors. Let's ask for coworkers. Let's start asking for neighborhoods. Let's start asking for regions and portions of our city. Let's start asking for our city. Let's make our way up in faith all the way to ask for our nation and the nations of the world. Let's, let's try some yeses or some amens. Let's see how that goes. Let's ask for our families. Let's ask for our friends. Let's ask for our coworkers, our neighbors, our neighborhoods regions of our city. Let's ask for our city. Let's ask for our province. Let's ask for our nation. And let's ask for the nations of the world. From the north, the west, the east, and the south. Let them come. Let them come to the gates. Let them come to the Lord and say, what must we do to be saved? What must we do that there would be a presence so thick, a glory so thick, a revival that is so strong, a picture of Jesus in the earth that is so powerful, that is so clear, that he would be seen in all his wonder and all his glory and all his splendor, that the awe would be returned to who he is. Signs and wonders and miracles, the things that the kingdom expresses, would be expressed in the earth and all the world would see. He really is the King of Kings. He really is the Lord of Lords. And not just by title, rightfully so. Because He is the most wonderful person that you could ever know. He is the most kind and generous and loving God that you could ever have relationship with. That's our portion. That's what He's called us to. Let the vision of this house increase. God, let the vision of this house increase. But God, let the vision in your body increase across the earth. Let people grab this message in Luke 5. Let them understand the size of the harvest that you want to bring in. Let them understand what's in your heart, that it's your will that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. All people, 
That's all people. There's no exclusion. It's God's heart that all people come to know him. That's the will of God. And I want to operate in the will of God. I want to share the same heart that he has and the same mind that he has. I want to participate in what, in what he's thinking about. I want to participate in what he's feeling. And it's for all people. That means that we've got to get in line and figure out a way. Here, see the blueprint of heaven of how all people are coming. All people is his heart. We want to share that heart. Let vision be released throughout the church and the earth, Father. Wake people up in the night. It says that the hearts of the kings are in the hands of the Lord. Continue to minister to leaders, God. Continue to minister within the government of heaven, the government of God on the earth. Continue to pour out vision to your people that we would prepare for the harvest that you've called for us. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, amen.